Welcome to the BBC's exclusive live coverage of the 2002 Booker Prize here in the Great Court of the British Museum for the very first time. As ever, there's been feverish speculation over which one of the six authors will win the world's most prestigious fiction award, which will shortly be announced later in this programme and also on BBC Two. In this magnificent hall, completed just two years ago, authors, literary agents, publishers and business executives have gathered to join in the feast and festivities and generally to have a bit of a party. Earlier this year, there was a lot of debate about whether the prize should be opened up to the Americans. It has turned out that the shortlist is a celebration of writing from the Commonwealth. There are no less than three writers who've made their homes in Canada. Carol Shields, Jan Martel and Rohinton Mystery. An Australian, Tim Winton. An Irishman, William Trevor. And just one British writer, Welshwoman Sarah Waters, competing for this year's prize. I'm going to be talking about the shortlisted novels with the chair of this year's Booker Judges and some literary heavyweights shortly. But first, here's John Wilson. I'm here in the museum's Egyptian sculpture galleries and I've been catching up with some of the key cultural and literary figures, finding out who they think should win this year's Booker Prize. Back to you, Kirsty. Well, three dinner guests kindly agreed to pause before pudding to talk about this year's prize. Peter Kemp, fiction editor of the Sunday Times, the novelist Nigel Williams and Professor Lisa Jardine, the chair of this year's Booker Judges. Lisa Jardine, I know you've decided it was your one chance at it. Did you get it right? Yep, we got it right. Was it a big fuss? Nope. That's 25 what... minutes it took us. Brilliant. That's what you're saying, but the judges created a big stir this year, uh, you know, about what is and what isn't a book of prize. You were all very mouthy about it. You wanted more humour, less portentous novels, no World War II. I mean, you were doing your own prescribing. Mouthy we were being. That's what we were being. You know, this is a prize about books and about reading. Our job, and the, ju the judges took it very seriously, was to talk about books a lot. Now, actually, there are five of us. We have five different views about books. And that's why you got mouthing off about different things. Some of us like them portentous, some of them liked it, less liked it funny, and some of us just liked a good read. But it is absolutely a lottery, isn't it, Nigel Williams? Because next year, another set of judges will have a completely different set of attitudes. Yeah, people often talk about there being such a thing as a booker book. I don't think there is any such thing as a booker book. I think there is simply a book, there is a bunch of people who respond to a various enormous number of books and then discuss those books and come up with well, this. Well, Peter, um, you know, were you quite pleased with the shortness this year? I was very pleased with this. I, I think there are six extremely interesting novels on the list. Well, let's now move on to the shortlist of books, which we'll go through in alphabetical order. The first up is Jan Martel. Jan Martel's Life of Pi is the story of an Indian boy who is shipwrecked while crossing the Pacific to Canada with his family and the contents of their own zoo. Pai is the lone human survivor and his only companion for his fantastic and terrifying voyage in a lifeboat is a 450 pound tiger. Pai's fascination with his dangerous shipmate develops into a complex psychological war over territory, power and food. It's an extraordinary tale of survival, optimism and faith. Well, here we are battling against the noise of downstairs, but first coming to you, Nigel Williams. On the cover, the reviewer described this book as magic realism, and on the dust flap, it said, a tale that will make you believe in God. Where are you entranced? Well, magic realism, a term coined, I think, by a Mexican journalist in, in, in sort of 1950, a bit like angry young men, I don't think it means anything. As far as this book's concerned, it, it was liable to put me off. I thought, my God, magic realism, no, no thank you. When I started to read the book, I realised that actually it was something far more interesting. Number one, the central character is named after a swimming pool. He's called... Piscine, Moritel, whatever Mattel. it's called. Yeah, it's a bit like calling your son Tooting Beck Lido Williams. I thought this was great. And I love the idea that the man who wrote this book really knows about animals. Right, well, I was going to say that to Peter Kemp because some books, the research is very, very heavy handed. But here, Jan Martel was learning about three different religions and animal behaviorism, child psychology, fish anatomy, 
and yet he wore it very lightly. Yeah, I mean, it's a book that moves along with absolutely terrific elan and vitality. Um, I think Nigel is right in that it's not really magic realism. And the tradition it comes from, really, is European fables. It's in the tradition of something like Voltaire's Candide. It's a book where there's a lot of savagery, also a lot of philosophy, cruelty and theories. It's about zoology and religion, are the two poles yeah. of the novel. I mean, Peter's got it. It's a serious book. I mean, I, I, the, the dust slap does it no favours. Yes. It's a serious book. It is about should you believe in God, can you believe in God at the end of this story or not. What do you make of the idea that there's very, a great ambiguity in the ending? No, if you read carefully, there's no ambiguity at the end. And we won't give that away just now. <laughs> but what I thought was extraordinary, you had these extraordinary images of, the, for example, an island blob swarming with meerkats in which 32 teeth are individually hanging in a kind of cocoon from the trees. Embedded in it, yeah, that's pretty... That's I mean, it's pretty wild it's stuff. stuff. Yeah, well, that's right at the end of the voyage. I, I, I really think Richard Parker, the tiger, is just... He's the hero of this novel. What do you think about this idea, that this was a kind of... In a sense, at the beginning, the author tries to draw you in by saying, well, actually, I'd heard about this. And so you were sort of either believing, is it a folk tale, is it a fable, is it I a I wasn't parable? always... I, I love the book, actually, but I wasn't always completely convinced by the enfolding devices. Uh, Richard Parker, the tiger, he's actually called Richard Parker, great name for a tiger. Um, he's called Richard Parker, the tiger, because there's been a, a newspaper mix-up about the guy who tried to I shoot him or shot him. Which is great. I love it. But I don't think one should read too much significance into fun. And I think this book is fun, which is great. Great. Well, now, now let's go straight on to the next book on the shortlist, Family Matters by Rohinton Mystery. Family Matters is the third of Rohinton Mysteries novels to be shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And like the two previous books, Such a Long Journey and A Fine Balance, it centres on the city of his birth, Bombay. It explores the turmoil created when an old man, Naraman Vakil, suffering from Parkinson's disease and a broken ankle, becomes completely dependent on his family. Forced out of his home by his stepchildren, Nariman goes to live with his married daughter, triggering deep emotional conflicts and the unravelling of family ties. Well, Peter Kemp uh, wrote to Mysteries in three novels, each of them about Bombay and each on the Booker Shortlist. What he does in this book, he lays bare the ter terrible corrosive effect of not only religion, but too much tradition and of poverty as well. I mean, Rohinton Mystery is a novelist who I always want to like more than I'm finally able to. I mean, I think he's so decent, so well motivated. He's terrific when he writes about poverty and circumscribed lives. But he always, for my taste, pushes it too far. Ultimately, things get a bit melodramatic. I mean, you've got two um, main places in, in, in the novel. You have um, Chateau Felicity and Pleasant Villa, and absolutely terrible things happen at these two addresses. And then you get this amazing scene, for instance, where a really unpleasant woman wants to get her stepfather out of the house. She pretends that the ceilings have to be repaired. Suddenly, a steel girder falls and brains her. I mean, irony doesn't get heavier but, than but, that, but, you know. But it wasn't, what he was doing very well was having a good dose of humour, because he's got both black humour and incredibly gentle humour between the generational divide of the grandparent and the grandson. Well, I wonder if that really was intended to be humorous, because the book gets blacker and blacker as it goes on, doesn't it? You, you get a letter writer whose sole function seems to be to tell you about atrocities in the rest of the subcontinent. What, what, what do you think, Lisa? Because this, in a sense, is yet another author who doesn't live where he writes, like no, William Trent. And, and that, and, you know, I think there's something about these Canadian authors who are writing robustly from inside Canada. There's nothing un-Canadian about this book any more than about um, the English patient, you know, on Darcy. Um, so what happens is you get, you actually get the opening out very delicately of the family story and it isn't from inside Bombay and the, the, the analysis, and there is analysis of the complexity of living in Bombay is very much seen from a Canadian, with a, heard is with that, a Canadian voice. Is that bogus? No, it's not at all bogus. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful book, full of delicacy and you can remember moments out of it, the two little boys camped out on the veranda with a tarpaulin over them because Grandpa is going to have the one bed in the living room. You know, beautiful. Very compassionate. I, I particularly love the idea that these children will actually do things that are untoward in order to stave off the family's financial plight. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I disagree slightly with Peter on this book. I, I felt it was a really great book, and I felt it really dealt with the agony of this Parsi family. It's a riveting document about Parsi life. 
a group of people I had known nothing about before I started to read this novel. Uh, you know, a Zoroastrianism, a religion that dates from Persia, you know, one of the oldest religions in the world. Our central character starts to experience this story. Alongside it is a fantastically rich Dickensian fable. No, it's not Dickensian, actually. He doesn't English, like to English novel fable, where the children, their favorite author is Lin you know, Enid Blyton and yeah. Biggles. I think this is fantastic. And I, I, if I had a criticism of it, it would be that sometimes, because of the immense sadness at the heart of it, and there's a hugely interesting relationship about a, a marrying out relationship that's not solved in the book, which is not resolved, and in a way, I think this author, I don't know whether he ever could resolve it. You talked about the whole uh, the business of uh, the Parsi tradition, and of course the father was incredibly skeptical and dismissive of the religion early on in his life. By the end of the book, he's become very hardline and very, very obsessive almost about religion. And that was quite a true portrayal of how life can often develop. Well, except you see, the book shows you how somebody starts to find a, a, a religious ritual comforting and convincing. The prayer beads, I felt I was an expert on Parsiism, if it's called that, guys, by the end of the book. Well, let's take a look at the next book, Unless, by Carol Shields. Carol Shields' Unless is the third Canadian novel in this year's shortlist. Rita Winters is a successful, middle-aged, middle-class writer whose quiet world is shattered when her daughter Nora turns her back on her family to sit silently begging on a street corner, a sign saying goodness around her neck. Through Rita's struggle to understand the pain that has brought about her daughter's crisis, the novel becomes a meditation on family relationships, on the silencing of women in life and in literature, and on the concept of goodness itself. Well, of course, Carol Shields is very unwell and cannot be here tonight. Um, Lisa, the character, the mother, Rita Winters, she can't control what's happening to her daughter. And central to this thesis is that women are never listened to, and that she has got no way of dealing with her daughter's problems, does that ring true? No, I'm not sure that's what it's about. This is a very angry novel. In Carol Shields, I've never much liked because there was something a little bit um, anodyne. The fabulous writing, but somewhat anodyne. This is an angry book. Yeah. This is a book about loss, about pain. And I don't think it's about women not being listened to. I think it is very strongly about the visceral pain of separation from a daughter who is the one thing you had that you felt somehow was, you, was true to you and belonged to you. And again, in this one, in terms of the, the, the siblings, mm. terrific. The best relationship for me was the girls yeah. going to see their sister Nora on a Saturday. And I thought that was very poignant. You've got teenage kids. I mean, you can understand how they act yeah, together. Yeah, they're all blokes. Uh, <laughs> and they probably would, I mean, the, the author of this book is, is amusing and pertinent about male authors who've gone about their influences. And as she says, all their influences are male. And it's, it's, it's quite subtle and quite sledgehammer at the same time. I, I thought it was a light and beautifully written performance. Uh, I felt in a way the real strength of the author was this wonderful domestic feel she has for the private life of families. There's a wonderful she line about the comfort of families. Peter? I mean, she's always very, very good at writing about people's lives. She fills her fiction with biographers. She writes biography. What I think she's doing in this book, though, is first of all showing you an ordinary, assured, comfortable-seeming domestic life, then showing you how it can be hit by calamity and how people cope with calamity. How do you cope with the fact that suddenly your life, almost your ordinary life, might be taken away from you? And you see the neighbours feeling awkward and uncomfortable and trying to be supportive. You see her getting on with her work as far as she can. How does she but still do respond to her husband? The whole question of the writer, the writer, the writer, 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 and this figure of the kind of Daniela. I thought Western. she was trying to give an extra dimension to the book there by suggesting there's a sort of feminist perspective onto things as well. But the most interesting thing I thought was a much more general one about what happens when something awful occurs and smashes through an but ordinary, it's comfortable small life. Small and banal yeah. and awful. Yes, That's yes, what's so important. Yes. It's not. September the 11th. What happens to families is something small and particular to them. Yes, and you, you imagine when you see a girl sitting in a car, not with goodness around her neck, but it makes you think the backstory. What is the backstory? Yes. Yes. Well, the other thing, of course, that is dealing with this year, there's been a lot of controversy about whether or not the prize will be opened up to America. Now, of course, Carol Shields was born in Chicago and is only eligible because she has made her home in Canada. 
What do you think? Do you think the prize should be opened up to America, Peter Kemp? Well, I don't see why there shouldn't be a parallel American booker and a playoff between, say, the American shortlist and the, and the, and the present sort of shortlist. Kind of but, a, I mean, trade embargo. Yeah, here. but I mean, as, as, as Lisa and I know, I mean, the judges are so laden with reading already, and you have to read in such a short period of time, in about four months, but basically. But does it necessarily mean more books? Yes, it it's does. It's bound to. It's bound to. Of if you're going to keep the quality well, high. If you're going to keep the Commonwealth in there, you know, we read books by authors we've never heard of. Now, if you've got the whole of America, you've got Jonathan Safran Foer, you've You've got Franson, you've got Donna Tartt. You know, if it's all in there, um, how are we going to notice these young up-and-coming I think the prize should be restricted to male red-haired <laughs> novelists with living glasses in living in south-west London. I think it's you're just right. a thought. It's just it's a thought. Just, yes, I think you're right. But do you think that, I mean, people in a sense don't read in particular... There's a fence around what people there read. Are, there, there are categories. The Orange Prize is for Anglophone writing by a woman, you know, anywhere in the world. You know, the Whitbread has its restrictions. The, the Pulitzer is only open to American citizens. The National Book Award in America is only... You have to have categories, because otherwise I would be dead, not half dead this evening. Right? You don't sound as if you're half dead to me, Lizzie. sounds as if you're enjoying it madly. Well, let's move on now to the next of our shortlisted books, William Trevor's The Story of Lucy Gold. At 74, William Trevor is the oldest shortlisted author. Like much of his work, the story of Lucy Galt is closely bound up in the landscape and history of rural Ireland and explores the tensions in small communities and close relationships. Set in Cork, it tells the story of eight-year-old Lucy, who runs away from home when her parents decide to leave the country in the wake of attacks on local Protestant families in 1921. The subsequent tragedy makes for a tale of lives suspended in time. Nigel Williams, first of all, I mean, the writing seems so effortless. It's incredibly elegiac, and he creates this heartbreaking character of Lucy Gold. I mean, I, for, my, for me, this is the book that should win the prize. Uh, I'll nail my colours to the mast. I think William Trevor is a fantastic writer. I think he has lucidity. I think he writes beautiful prose. The first sentence of this book, which I'm afraid I cannot quote from memory, something like, Captain Everett Galt wounded the man in the shoulder. It's a very simple narrative sentence. It conceals a wealth of distrust and double dealing. Now, everything in this story, it seems to me, crystallizes stuff in Trevor's work that has been going on for 30 or 40 years. He wrote a story many years ago about a Protestant family who get left behind, an ascendancy family. Remember the ascendancy novel, after Somerville and Ross doesn't really exist. He's the person who really has created this art form single-handedly, a heroic endeavor. This is a wonderfully moving, and it doesn't shortchange you about solutions. That's what I think is fantastic about this book. You know, there's a horrific conflict in Northern Ireland. Nobody is let off lightly. Suffering is followed on its singular path right to the end through the eyes of every character. Now, William Trevor famously says he doesn't analyze his books, but at least not in public. <clears throat> but he has said about this one that this is the nearest he's come with the character of Lucy Gold to portraying goodness. Yeah. I mean, goodness is much harder to portray than evil. Yeah, and William Trevor is one of the few novelists who can do it. I mean, I agree entirely with Nigel. But this, I think, is a masterpiece. It's a really great novel written by a superb novelist on, on, on peak form. And it's almost great against the odds. I mean, he's dealing with fictional territory that's been dealt with so often. Ireland, the Troubles, you know, developments in Ireland. Uh, he's written about some of this himself. There's an enormous freshness to the book. It's a book in which... 80 years have got to pass, and you actually, they actually pass the way they do in real life. You don't get change signposted very crudely. You don't notice until something's changed. Oh, yes, it has well, slightly altered. Lisa, do you have the same passion for this book as these other people well, do? The, I think what's interesting about what Peter's just said is that he, uh, he is pointing out that this book does have quite a lot in common emotionally with the Carol Shields, because what, what viewers won't know is that the troubles come into this book only, as it were, Glancingly, that is to say, the whole chain of events is set off in a way that is really importantly true by, by a wounding of a boy in the shoulder, a casual bit of, of, of thuggery on his part, perhaps, and which is, you know, which is politically um, uh, stimulated, and then the response of Everard Galt. And that sets in train this inexorable course of pain that runs through an entire lifetime. And Lisa, can I also Quite a point religious out... Book, do you think? No, it's not religious. It's but about, again, it's about you, family. It's about Lucy's living through 
the pain of what and she did guilt. to her family. Yes. And it's about stories, because he, there's a wonderful sentence here <coughs> where he says, well, the story of Lucy Gold, it's effortlessly done in a paragraph. People embellished this story. They said, oh, well, you know, he didn't win the book or he did win. You know, it, it's fabulous in a very relaxed way. Yeah, but he said, he also said, when he says it is man your typewriter, he doesn't like to write anything that could not be possible. And I, one flaw I felt in the book was this idea this couple very wrapped up in themselves never came would back. never come back. Not only that, we're not talking about the 18th century, no. or the 20th never century. Never phoned. No, no, no. I was thinking more of the time as being delivered around Europe. Their daughter's <laughs> dead. They think their daughter's thing. dead. I mean, the, the Charles. catastrophe happens. Uh, the catastrophe I'm sorry, happens that was a problem because for me. The catastrophe happens because they're so wrapped up in one another. They don't notice a little girl and, and her strong feelings. And well, so, and they stay wrapped up. And they up. think well, she's dead. And as soon as the wife dies, she does not come back. Well, now for the fifth book on the short list, Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. Sarah Waters' third novel, Fingersmith, is, like her earlier works, a Victorian pastiche. It tells the tale of two orphan girls, Sue Trinder, a London gutter snipe, setting out to swindle a young heiress of her fortune, and her intended victim turned lover, the delicate but depraved Maud Lilly. From a thieves kitchen in South London, to an ominous country house, to a nightmarish gothic lunatic asylum, this study in abuse and the corruption of innocence is loaded with heart-stopping plot twists and is told through a pacey narration that's as untrustworthy as its two heroines. Tell me, Peter Kemp, this is a pastiche. Has it got profound things to say? I don't think it has. I mean, this book disappointed me. I think Sarah Waters is a terrifically gifted novelist. I thought her last novel, Affinity, was really extraordinary. In this book, I think there's a drop down. Um, it's too close to Wilkie Collins. It's too long. Um, I think as you read it, you feel you're slightly in the realm of waxworks. There's quite a good story, but there's nothing else. It doesn't have anything really important to say. Um, I think that she spent so much energy researching sort of thief slang and stuff like this that the characters are... It wears are, its it does, heavily, it does. unlike the Martel. Exactly, and because of this, there's not enough energy and attention going into the characterization. I think the characters are really quite cliche. And yet it's the book that people are reading. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. It's are they reading it because... Uh, tipping the velvet. No, yes. they were reading it before. Remember, we've been reading this book since April. Um, <laughs> and so I've been watching people read. No, um, actually, I think it's done her a disservice to have Tipping the Velvet on because the critics who haven't read the books, not like Peter and Nigel, um, write things like a lesbian romp. You know, there's no romp in this book. That was Tipping the Velvet. You know, this and is... not enough lesbian, <laughs> may I say. Is a... I think you missed the end. Did you get to the end? No, I did get to the end. I, I, I'm sort of rather in Peter's camp, but... I think the point about the book, the problem I had with the book, and I think is she's a really good writer. I think the pace of the narrative is very stunningly professional. It's about a complex Isn't that series of... the problem of, that it's professional? Well, no. The problem, I think, technically, is it's, it's, it's about a series of double bluffs. Yeah. Yes. This, is, this is a book about confidence tricksters yes. who pretend to be something, and the trouble is when you go through that mirror image more than once, in a way the flavour of the narrative slightly goes off. So who's fooling who is the crux of this story. It's a bit like The Sting. It also has something in common with that fantastic book about a real Victorian crime by the man who invented ER. Um, you know, a, sim a quite incredible world of Victorian crime. The trouble is, once you've pulled that trick twice, you, you rather enclose your characters in the prison of the plot. I think she's a fantastic writer and she will go on to write something even better. I mean, it, it, you know, pastiche happens in other areas and happens really rather well. I mean, Jack Maddox. Well, it does. You know, it's just that she seems just to settle for pastiche and think, oh, yeah, I'll have a, a lonely mansion, well, I'll have a madhouse, I'll, I'll have dubious parenting. Like and didn't you feel as you were reading it, think, well, actually, this reminds me of Wilkie Collins, and why am I not reading Wilkie Collins? Because that's the authentic because thing. Because you want to read Sarah Waters, right? Not, not on this <laughs> level, I don't think. She's the first to say that she has this obsession with Victorian novels, and what yeah. she's doing is bringing perhaps more female characters of her own making to no, what is no, this an established is not, template. This is not pastiche, because this is a novel, it's a very canny, again, it does that thing that Martel does and actually that Mystery does. These are very 20th century novels. Things happen to the characters in Fingersmith that couldn't happen in a Wilkie Collins. Actually, one of the judges said, they all shit. 
you know. They go to the bath <laughs> and they piddle you know, They piddle, they're always piddling. And, and there's a very elegant way in which, it's a, it's a very elaborate joke. I don't and think, when Peter and I are worried about certain elements of the reality of the characters, like the I don't think we're talking about what people did in 19th century novels and what they do now. I think it's something to do with... Psychological and emotional. Exactly so. I, I, I think it's a good book. I don't think it's in the Rohingya mystery class because lived, felt experience of the writer, you know, is, uh, of the character through the writer, is not quite there as evident as it well, is in... Well, um, Lisa's just been talking about the number of people in the tube that were reading uh, The Water's Boot, but now we can go to Martin Hicks of Waterson's to tell us how sales have been going. I think that the judges have been really clear this year in terms of saying to the public what they're looking for in a Booker Prize winner. And they've said that, above all, they're looking for a good story. Of course, they're looking for beautiful writing and interesting use of language. But by telling the public that they're really looking for a good story, well, that's exactly what the public want. There are three that have really taken off this year in terms of the public response. They are Fingersmith by Sarah Waters, uh, The Life of Pi by Jan Martel, and William Trevor's book, The Story of Lucy Galt. Whatever we've sold so far, we're going to have sold about five times as many as that by Christmas. Um, the public do take the Booker Prize as a really good recommendation. So lots of people will be unwrapping the Booker winner on Christmas morning, and lots of people will be coming in on Wednesday morning to buy it. I will soon find which one they will be unwrapping, but first on to the sixth and final book on the shortlist, Tim Winton's Dirt Music. Dirt Music by Tim Winton, set against the beautiful but uncompromising landscape of Western Australia, is a modern-day love story about two bruised and desperate people. Georgie Jutland is unhappy and restless, and her fragile relationship with her fisherman boyfriend is shattered when she begins an affair with the town's loner, Luther Fox. Scarred by a family tragedy, Fox must confront some ugly truths about his past if he and Georgie are ever to find happiness. So, Nigel Williams, a young Australian man writing about a woman, Georgie Dutland, who's this strong, tough, feisty Australian woman. I thought this was a man's idea of what tough women was meant to oh, be. Oh, Christ, like. she's an Australian bloke, Kirsty. Absolutely. You know, uh, he, 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 she who thinks Australian is Australian man, you know. No, I, I, I liked its male atmosphere, and one of the things I've always liked about Australia is everybody is a bloke. Um, the thing that I, I thought was really good about the book was the way it got on with the story. So, very often this curt, taut prose that people talk about, and I think, oh, let's have the whole sentence, not just a noun, please. You know, in this case, was serving a very controlled sense of narrative and a real sense of, you know, narrowness. I don't want to go to Bombay after reading Rohinton Mystery. I certainly don't want to go to Perth after reading Tim Winton. If I had a problem with the book, coast. it was that, it, once again, like a lot of these books, I'm fascinated by the, the way in which panels tend to choose books collectively, and the heart of it is, once again, a family history secret buried which the, the narrative propels us towards. It, it's common in all the books that we've been reading. And I have to say, the secret is a little bit of a letdown for me, but... Well, yes, that, 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 let's leave that a secret at the moment. Let's talk a bit about this dirt music, but yet, you know, music flows to this, it's not going to music, but I thought his, his use of music was incredibly gauche. Incredibly gauche, the way... Oh, I thought, it was, I thought the book was terrific. I mean, I think he's so good, the way he conveys injury and the way people cope with it. I, mean, I think he's got two big strengths, Winston, as a novelist. One is writing about place and community, which he does really searingly, vividly in this novel. Then dealing with people who are trying to cope with trauma of one kind or another. And uh, I thought the way in which the three central figures work out some kind of solution is just brilliantly done. I mean, you so much believe in these characters. I mean, the last two words of the novel are she's real, the central figure. I think you could say that about every single character. He's she's excellent. Dialogue is so convincing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter Kemp, we know that uh, Lisa's made her decision. Who do you think should win tonight? I think probably William Trevor, but I'd be very, very pleased if Jan Martel or Tim Winton won. And you, Nigel? My number one choice is William Trevor. If he doesn't, I'd be very happy for a hint and mystery. Uh -huh. And Lisa's lips are well and truly sealed. And now over to John Wilson, who's been catching up with some of the guests to find out which book they're backing. This is a literary critic, I presume you've read all of the books. Which is your favourite? Um, I haven't read all of them. I read five of them. 
my favourite is the Roe Hinton Mystery because I think it's the most wonderfully warm, rich, almost Victorian novel. Anthony Trollope could have written it. I personally like to see Tim Winton win because I'm a huge fan of his and have been for a long time. And None of his books, are, I think, have ever done well enough here. And I think he's a writer that English audiences would really love. I've read The William Trevor, uh, which was brilliant but miserable. It's one of the most miserable books I've read for a very long time. It's his I stock mean, in trade, though, isn't it? Well, it's sort of even more miserable than usual. Um, I know it's, there's meant to be a, a hint of redemption at the end. It's a bit atonement, but I'm not, I'm not sure I buy it. I think there's one outstanding book that will be read in five years' time, which is The Life of Pi. Which you're holding in your hand I'm holding in my hand. I hope that'll win. Fionn, which books have you enjoyed reading this year? Well, I thought that Sarah Waters was very strong. I also liked Jan Martel's Life of Pi. So those are the two I'm rooting for. And of those two, which one? Uh, that's a difficult question. Well, I always get these things wrong, but my money is on Sarah Waters tonight. How are you feeling at the moment? Are you nervous? Um, I was a bit nervous just now, but now I've had a drink, I feel a bit better. I mean, I, to be honest, I, I don't have much expectation of winning, and actually that's quite nice, because I just think, you know, enjoy the evening, and whichever way it goes, fine by me. I enjoyed Rohinder Mysteries book very much, and I think, for my money, that's probably the one which will probably get through. Do you think the judges will agree with you? Who knows? Tim Winston, you don't look like you're enjoying yourself here. Uh, it's not quite my idea of a good time, but... Uh, Nerves? A, a few. A few. As long as I get through without hurling, I'll be happy. Have you read the other books on the shortlist? Yeah, I read them all. My favourite is Carol Shields's In Less. Um, it's an extraordinarily achieved novel. It's flawlessly written. It's the most subversive novel on the shortlist. It hasn't been decided yet, but everybody here has their own view on which book should win the Booker Prize 2002. Two to the exclusive live coverage of the 2002 Man Booker Prize for Fiction, the biggest event in the literary year. In just under half an hour, we'll discover who has won live here on the BBC. For the first time in the Booker's 30-year history, the BBC... BC cameras have been allowed to witness the judges' deliberations. Last month, David Baddiel, Russell Sellen Jones, Sally Vickers, and Erica Wagner met under the chairmanship of Lisa Jardine to reduce the long list of 20 to the final six. Here's a flavour of their discussions. Well, well, I don't know what a book a book is, but we got them. Well, there is a notion, isn't there? There's a notion. I don't you know. I haven't done this before. I, mean, I, I never read 130 books in a year, <laughs> so I, for all I know, this is a great year, you know. But uh, but what I did feel is I didn't read a great book uh, at all. I, I, I felt all the books I read. Um, I, either I, I thought, well, this is terrible, or I thought this is good, but it's still got stuff in it that I wish wasn't there. Russell, Rohinton mystery. Yes, well, this is a novel of uh, small lives surviving in a very big universe. The milieu of the novel is, is Victorian, Bombay, modern-day Bombay, um, is, is a sort of Dickensian tableau, so I think he brings that city to life. The books I think we are all interested in as judges is books that don't look like they've got another agenda yeah. going on, yes. and that agenda tends to be, I'm going to win a prize with this yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas people who are writing just for the voice that's inside them, they're trying to write mm, that out. Yeah. I mean, the Carol mm. Shields book, I think, is a it's prime a example of that. There's nothing else going on except an author who wants to express some mm. conflict and struggle that's going on inside her. I think one of the problems I had with the books is there were so few that I regarded as really funny. You know, any real humour in the books. In the same way that comedies don't normally win Oscars, comedies yeah. don't well, normally win comedy, the book. I think comedy is the deeper And that's why anyway. I, I like the Howard Jacobson book, you see, because it really made me laugh out loud. You know. I'm going to bring in the Zadie Smith, the autograph man, um, because certainly I feel, first of all, I think it has a, an extraordinary fresh voice and an energy to that voice and it is very funny at least I laughed a lot in it. She's also the one writer writing out of her own gender that's totally convincing. Um, not one moment did I think this this voice um, sort of fails. Yeah she's um, got a couple of bits where Alex Lee isn't listening properly to yeah. uh, his girlfriend which I thought was really accurate. Yes, <laughs> Talk a bit about the end of Life of Pi, because we don't seem to have a consensus about what happens at the end of Jan Martel's Life of Pi. Do you want to start us off, Erica? You could read it as, and it was all a dream. 
which is not something I like in a novel, in a movie, in anything. Um, and I, I really had a, had a problem with this until I remembered the end um, of The Wizard of Oz, where um, it is all a dream, possibly. It's a fantastical story. Um, and at the end, you have two alternatives. So the reader's given a choice. You can either sort of say this is not, this is a, a, a story of the mind, or it actually, actually, actually happened. Rereading Tim Winton's book, there was an image in it which I hadn't got at all the first time around, which is the Christmas tree. And that made sense of the epiphany of the ending for me. But I, I did think that everyone was a bit tough in it, and that it's a bit of a heavy but metal But Georgie, book, what really. a relief to have a heroine who is really yeah. tough. Luther but Fox. it's very Australian, that, I think, Luther that every, every character... I don't mind, I don't mind if a woman has to be Luther Australian Fox to be tough. Though. Sally, it's could you little. take us through what you find strong about the William Trevor, the story of Lucy Gold. We're not looking at a, at a naturalistic um, chain of events. We're looking at the juxtaposition of states of human experience. Mm. Uh, and it's the kind of thing which I think is powerfully resonant. Uh, and also the idea that all lives, however apparently desolate and lost, have some core of quality in them if we can only find it. Uh, Sarah Fingers Waters. Smith, Sarah Waters. I just could not put this book down. No, no, I, I, I mean, and I don't know anybody who's read it who can. No, it's I don't know. It, it is the only book that I couldn't put down. Yeah, I, 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 well, okay, Sally. <laughs> we do know Sally one person. Put Sally, could, times, Sally right? put it down several times. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't take historical characters like, say, Oliver Twist and give him a new life. They are her own creations, but the, the structure and the, and, the, and the form is borrowed. Yeah, it's also. Great storytelling, and that's not to be sniffed at, I think. No, yeah. not Particularly at all. when yeah. you've read 130 yeah. books. Yeah. Yeah. So there were the judges discussing which book should get on the shortlist. The six books they decided on are Yet Martell's Life of Pi, Rowington Mysteries Family Matters, Unless by Carol Shields, The Story of Lucy Galt by William Trevor, Tim Winton's Dirt Music, and Fingersmith by Sarah Waters. We'll be hearing from the judges again later, but now. Here are the shortlisted authors, starting with Rowington Mystery and Jan Martell. Jan Martell's Life of Pi is the story of a 16-year-old Indian boy who learns about life and animal behaviour from growing up in a zoo. While emigrating to Canada with his family and their animals, Pi is shipwrecked. In his lifeboat, he floats across the Pacific, the sole human survivor with only a tiger for company. This extraordinary tale shifts the boundaries of the possible and encourages its readers to believe in miracles. What I wanted to do was, in a sense, do what religion does, which is push the limits of the believable until you're forced to make some sort of leap, a leap of faith. I think faith involves letting go. Pi, who practices three religions, he's a Hindu, a Muslim, and a Christian, obviously is someone who lets go a lot who trusts that things will work out. He progresses as the ordeal goes on. He learns to adapt. In some ways, he becomes like the tiger. He learns to do what he has to do to get by. And he goes through a whole range of emotions. The worst pair of opposites is boredom and terror. Sometimes your life is a pendulum swing from one to the other. The hours last forever. You are so bored, you sink into a state of apathy close to a coma. Then the sea becomes rough and your emotions are whipped into a frenzy. Yet even these two opposites do not remain distinct. In your boredom, there are elements of terror. You break down into tears. You scream. You deliberately hurt yourself. And in the grip of terror, you yet feel boredom, a deep weariness with it all. Only death consistently excites your emotions, whether contemplating it when life is safe and stale, or fleeing it when life is threatened and precious. Rohinton Mysteries' Family Matters concerns the crises in the Chinoy family when its elderly patriarch, Nariman Vakil, who has Parkinson's, breaks his ankle and becomes completely dependent on his children. It's a novel of dark secrets, where the dramas affecting three generations of a family are played out against the backdrop of the religious and economic divides of contemporary Bombay. When Nariman Vakil arrives, in the little two-room flat in Pleasant Villa and 
As the trial begins for the Chinoy family, we find that it's always in the smaller moments, in the smaller details, that uh, it is possible for the characters to fail or succeed. Jahangir, of course, has no difficulty demonstrating his love. On the very first day, he decides he wants to feed his grandfather. His mother realizes what a special moment this is. The balcony door framed the scene. Nine-year-old, happily feeding 79. Hidden by the screen of damp clothes, she watched. She felt she was witnessing something almost sacred, and her eyes refused to relinquish the precious moment, for she knew instinctively that it would become a memory to cherish, to recall in difficult times when she needed strength. Johangir filled the spoon again and raised it to his grandfather's lips. A grain of rice strayed, lingering at the corner of his mouth. Jahangir took the napkin to gently retrieve it before it fell. And for a brief instant, Roxana felt she understood the meaning of it all, of birth and life and death. Well, I'm joined now by Ben Okri, a former Booker winner. What did you make of the shortlist this year? I thought it was surprising and varied and um, had many unexpected elements. And what was so surprising about it? Well, I think on the whole, you find that the, the literary establishment has its mentality of favorites, and the judges completely exploded that. They chose people they wouldn't have suspected, and one or two that they'd always hoped would be there. People like William Trevor um, and Carol Shields. But otherwise, I think it was richly surprising, and I like that element. And what about the controversy about the possibility of opening the prize up to the Americans? What do you think of that idea? Actually, I'm completely relaxed about that on the condition that the Americans open their prizes to us. I, it has to be a, a mutual thing. Um, it has to be based on complete confidence. It's got to be based on an openness between the two continents. But more than that, I think that I think Booker Prize winners on the whole don't concern themselves with that. They write the best books they can write. Ben Okri, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And now for the next two books in the shortlist, Carol Shields, who's unable to be here, but to whom we spoke earlier at her home in Canada, and William Trevor, who reads from his novel, The Story of Lucy Galt. Carol Shields' Unless is a meditation on goodness, on families, and on the silencing of women in life and in literature. It tells the story of novelist Rita Winters, whose life is ripped apart when her teenage daughter Nora is found begging on a street corner, a sign saying goodness hanging round her neck. I've always been in, interested in the idea of goodness and why we are good and why goodness exists at all. And, and I, think, I think we're good because the world demands that we be good. Uh, there's too much neglect and need in the world for us to be anything other than good. But I often see young men, young women, destitute on the streets. And I always look at them and I think, how did this happen? And are their parents suffering from this separation? Of course, I think that they are. People suffer dreadfully from all kinds of things, from, from illness and uh, from... Um, a feeling of being alone in the world. Uh, but I do think that uh, estrangement from a child or the loss of a child has to be one of the most difficult problems uh, people ever are asked to, to deal with. She was lost. Somehow she has encountered a surfeit of what the world offered and had taken an overdose she was not going to be able to survive. Or else not a surfeit, but its opposite. A trick of perception may have fooled Nora into believing that life is too full to be embraced and too beautiful to bear. But the truth is something very different, and I am trying to figure out what that truth might be. Sometimes I come close to knowing Nora's lost because she is suddenly realizing that she has been, because of her, she is female, she has been left out of society.
In The Story of Lucy Galt, Irish author William Trevor examines guilt and forgiveness in rural Ireland. In 1921, when her parents decide to leave their family home on the Cork coast in the wake of attacks on Protestant landowners, eight-year-old Lucy resists this upheaval and resolves to stay in Ireland. She runs away and a series of calamitous mishaps lead her family to believe she has died. The ensuing tragedy takes its toll on all their lives. The story of Lucy Galt is William Trevor's 13th novel and is second to be shortlisted for the Booker. Although he was born and raised in Ireland, he has since chosen to live in the south of England. He said recently, I couldn't write about Ireland if I lived there. I would be much too close. Yet Trevor remains closely engaged with the complexities of his native country. And in the story of Lucy Galt, his character's deep attachment to their homeland is central to the novel. I don't want to leave Lahadane, Lucy said on the strand. None of us wants to, lady. He bent down and lifted her up the way he used to when she was little. He held her in his arms and made her look out over the calm sea. He put her down again and wrote with a pebble on the sand. Lucy Galt, he wrote. Now that's a lovely name. They climbed the cliff at the place where it was easy, up to the field next to the O'Reilly's turnip field, where there'd been barley last year. When Mr O'Reilly was weeding whatever crop was there, he'd wave to her. Why must we go, she cried. Because they don't want us here, her papa said. I'm joined by John Carey, who was uh, the chair of the Booker Judges in 1982. What are the kind of pitfalls that judges often fall into? One pitfall is that they never agree, of course. I mean, it's very difficult. That's the best way, isn't it? But the worst pitfall is that they will opt for a book that no one really wants because everyone wants so fiercely one book and others don't want it that a kind of compromise book will be elected, voted for, and that's the worst thing. Well, hope that doesn't happen tonight. But what do you make of the judges saying that we want less of the big portentous novels that are actually setting out to win awards? I mean, David Baddiel's Guide to Winning the Booker Prize, you know, less books about World War II, the Holocaust, written by elderly people. What do you make about yeah, that? Yeah, I've always been in favour of a more populist approach, as a matter of fact, to the prize. I think that's a very good thing. I mean, it seems to me there are genre writers like, say, Ruth Rendell. Why is she never on a Booker shortlist, you know? I'm, it seems to me that if you judge a book by its subject, you know, it's an important subject, so it's an important book, that's completely mis... That's just a misapprehension. What makes a book is how it's written. And, of course, another set of judges next year with different attitudes. I think I may be a judge next year, so... Ah, well, now we know it. Well, now we're going to hear from the remaining two shortlisted authors, Tim Winton and Sarah Waters. Sarah Waters' third novel, Fingersmith, is the story of two young orphan girls and the circumstances that force them to betray each other to save themselves. Like Waters' previous novel, Tipping the Velvet, an adaptation of which is currently running on BBC Two, Fingersmith is a Victorian pastiche. Filled with dizzying plot twists, it brings lesbian love to the heart of a Dickensian world of corsets and crinolines. Fingersmith is really a sort of modern version of the um, Victorian sensation novel. And these were startling novels in their days because they, they focused for a start on, on crime and violence. A particularly appealing thing for me is the way the genre focuses on women, transgressive women, women who are mad or have murdered their husbands. Fingersmith really has two heroines, Sue Trinder and Maud Lilly. What I like about, about the pair of them is that they're both in very different ways, you know, innocent and corrupt. Sue's been brought up in a kind of thieves' kitchen in, in the borough in London. Um, Maud's been brought up in a, in a gothic country house by a rather sinister book collector uncle um, that come from vastly different class backgrounds. And that's one of the things that interests me, you know, that, that they're going to have a relationship, a same-sex relationship, but there's this enormous class difference, you know, the, a class difference that sort of writes itself on their very bodies. You know, they often look at each other's bodies and reflect on the differences between them. Though at first she wouldn't let me touch her bare hands, in time, since I said I would be gentle, she began to let me. When her fingernails grew long, I cut them with a pair of silver scissors she had that were shaped like a flying bird. Her nails were soft and perfectly clean and grew quickly like a child's nails. The skin of her hands was smooth, but like the rest of her, too smooth to be right, 
I never saw it without thinking of the things, rough things, sharp things, that would mark or hurt it. I was glad when she put her gloves back on. Set in a fishing community in Western Australia, Tim Winton's dirt music is the story of rebellious housewife Georgie Jutland and her unlikely love affair with the town's loner, Luther Fox. Before these two damaged people can be together, each must go on a personal journey of discovery and renewal. Well, the story begins you know, in a town called White Point. It's a rough kind of place where the wind blows and everybody's besieged by light and heat. As the novel progresses further north, it goes further into the tropics and, and the edges of the desert. And landscape, I guess, makes the characters smaller and makes them cower in a way and strips them bare. Well, I think Lou, I mean, he, he's sort of taken out divorce proceedings against humanity, really, and certainly from his own past. And he flees into the wilderness in a way of, I guess, trying to leave everything behind. But what he doesn't realise um, is just how overpowering uh, the landscape uh, will be, how hostile the conditions are and how, how little reserves the average Western person has when it comes to living um, without resources, um, without help, without company. He buys a sheaf of survey maps and spreads them out on the floor of his room. Inland, there's the great sandy desert. Further north, the coast looks like a dropped plate, all island shards and crazed river mouths. And behind this lonely looking fringe is a profusion of converging ranges and seasonal watercourses, country he can barely imagine. What he wants is to slope off into the bush somewhere, do what he should have done more than a year ago instead of slinking around the edge of White Point like a feral dog. So those are the six books on the shortlist. Early in the evening, the judges met again here to decide on the winner, and the atmosphere was pretty tense. So what do we think of Life of Pi? I think it's a, it's a kind of fairy tale, but it reveals the power of fairy tales in that way, and the way that fairy tales can express real things. I think it's, it's a book with a marvelous idea, incredibly exciting. Um, I'm just not sure about how it the, the structure of it works in a book that has to be structured. There's this sense that everything you've read may not in fact have happened and I find that to be a kind of tired postmodernist trick. The William Trevor I've come to see as a kind of fable or parable. Seemingly tragic events can have tragic consequences but not the tragic consequences that we would have thought. I wondered why it seems to be artificially set, kept apart. You know, the one story in Italy and one story left in Ireland. And that was my only problem with it. Yeah. Okay, Fingersmith. It's the, the book on this list, and probably the book I read throughout this whole process, that was the one I wanted to carry on reading most of all. It pretends to be pastiche, but amongst the pastiche novels we read, it, yeah. it doesn't have... It, it, has a, it, it talks about things that pastiche wouldn't talk about. Yeah. It's a robustly yeah. 20th century well, novel. I think the well, it's not pretending to be anything else. I also think, structurally, um, it's very, very clever, mm. and she does things that, in, a, in the hands of a lesser writer, mm. you just wouldn't swallow. If right. the plotting is complicated in Fingersmith, mm. my God, it's complicated in the mystery, which I love. The, the hugeness of the canvas, and yet the minuteness of the detail, and the delicacy of the awfulness of the family. It's also another novel about goodness of a kind, yes, you know, fa families struggling against um, a, a crushing world uh, and trying to survive. The thing for me about the Carol Shields is the topic it takes. It's been written about a great deal as the story of a family disaster, the loss of a child, the mother's grief. But I think it's an, a meditation on and an exploration of goodness. And for me, I think that's a very brave thing to do. I think also it's a very, it's a very angry book yeah. and she's not known for being an angry mm. writer. And I think that was a great revelation. Tim Winton hits you with its... It, Georgie Jutland, mm. right from the beginning. It's a tough book. With it is a tough book. What I believe is called muscular prose <laughs> in it. And I don't it, it, agree it, with you about being, it being tough, David. OK. Go on. You don't agree with any of us, but no, I mean, no, just I me. Do. I think it's tough, do <laughs> I think we all think it's tough, don't well, we? Well, I don't agree. I wouldn't call it tough. I think it's a tender book. The landscape is tough. And if you want to read the characters, if you like, you read the landscapes, yes. his descriptions of them. And I, you know, I, I think he's loyal to this place. Tim Winton, uh, and somehow he, bring, he creates characters out of them. They're sculpted out of the place. 
Well, we understand that the judges did manage to come to an agreement and we're all desperate to find out who's won and who's got the cheque for £50,000. So I'd like now to ask the chair of the judges, Lisa Jardine, to come up and announce the winner of this year's Brooker Prize. Ladies and gentlemen, judging the Man Booker Prize has been a wonderful experience. As you saw, thanks to my fellow judges, David Baddiel, Russell Kellen-Jones, Sally Vickers, and Erica Wagner. I drove them hard and they responded with total commitment and brilliant critical reading. We have worked throughout as a team. There have been vigorous intellectual disagreements, but no fights. There's also been a lot of shared pleasure. This is a golden age for British and Commonwealth fiction. For the diversity of its voices, its breadth of vision and sheer vitality, there is fine, precise writing and virtuoso plotting. Novels from every corner of the Commonwealth and the Republic of Ireland coexist in perfect harmony with the homegrown British varieties. What we looked for was simply quality, and we looked for books that readers, like us, would delight in reading. There, there were books of real quality among the 130 we read, which did not even make the long list. There were many we loved, but which fell by the wayside. Among them, Justin Cartwright's White Lightning, Anita Bruckner's The Next Big Thing, B.K. De Silva's Beethoven's Tench, and Janice Galloway's Clara. There has been an extraordinary amount of interest in the Man Booker Prize this year, with many column inches of serious and not so serious stories in the press, from Bombay to Winnipeg and from Chicago to Melbourne. More important by far, though, than the press interest has been the interest shown by readers, exchanging views in reading groups, book clubs and chat rooms, voting online and in classrooms. Besides the authors of novels, readers are the lifeblood of fiction, and we, the judges, salute them. The reputation of the Man Booker Prize stands higher than it ever has, and it begins a new era under its new sponsorship in terrific shape. So now it only remains for me to invite Mr. Harvey McGrath, chairman of the Man Group, to join me on the platform for the presentation. And the winner of the 2002 Man Booker Prize for Fiction is Life of Pi by Anne Martel. When this started, it was like being in a plane, and the plane's about to crash, and everything's shaking, and the engines have fallen. But now, I feel like I'm in the arms of a beautiful woman. I have a few people to thank. First and foremost, my editors. Uh, Diane Martin, my editor at Knopf Canada. Also, Jamie Bing at Canongate, and Anne Patty at Harcourt. I'd like to thank my agents, Jackie Kaiser, Nicole Winstanley, and Derek Johns. Thank you also to the jury of the Booker Prize for deciding that of the six fine books on the short list, mine was the luckiest.
And being from Canada, I will now speak in French for a few sentences. Merci à ma famille et à mes amis au Québec et au Canada. Célébrons cette victoire à mon retour. Lastly, I would li like to thank readers for having met my imagination halfway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So that is it. The winner of this year's Booker Prize is Jan Martel for The Life of Pi. And what's so extraordinary, because there's so many big heavyweight publishers, five of the books were published by big heavyweight publishers, but Life of Pi was published by Canongate, a small publishing house which will now, of course, be in Clover. Because the main thing, as we heard earlier from uh, the Watterson's booksellers, that the sales of the book, that the winner of the Booker Prize will rise by at least five times. And the thing about this book is it can be read in many different ways. It'll be an incredibly popular book because the point is, is it a fable? Is it an allegory? Apparently, Jan Martel had an extraordinary spiritual journey producing this book. He started off an atheist. He had three different religions to research and put into this book, along with animal psychology, child psychology, the, the, the anatomy of fish, the idea of how tigers actually operate. So this is something for everyone in this book. And at the end, Jan Martel said that he had been on a spiritual journey. So in fact, for him and for everybody else here, he's been a tremendously popular winner. Not to say that people like William Trevor, who wrote an amazingly elegiac, wonderful book, will not be remembered here as a great shortlist as winner. So, in fact, tonight, the winner of the Man Booker 2002 prize is Jan Martel. Well, in a couple of minutes, I'll be talking to Jan Martel, but now over to John Wilson, who's gauging the reaction to the result. William, the writer, and by Peter Kemp, the fiction editor of the Sunday Times. Reactions first. Did they pick the right book? Well, my favourite book of the list was William Trevor's, and I'm sick as a parrot that he hasn't won it. But I do think any book that's got a tiger called Richard Parker and that starts with a long description of a three-toed sloth and how it lives its life in deep confusion it can't be all bad. So good luck to Jan Martel. Peter, I know you love the William Trevor as well, but what about the Jan Martel? I think it's a really worthwhile choice. I mean, it's a decision that throws the spotlight on a not very well-known writer who's doing something very original, very exciting. He's playing around with ideas. He's dealing with lots of theories. He's also writing about animal behavior and real savagery. It's a book full of kind of ferocious energy, lots of wit and comedy. It makes you think and it makes you shudder. And I, I think it should be applauded for that. A lot of people have talked about this being a magical book. It's very much a mystical book as well, isn't it? Well, actually, one thing I really liked about the book, when I started to read it, I thought it was going to be one of those magical books about tigers that explode. Actually, it's really knowledgeable about how animals behave. His description of how a man tames a Bengal tiger in a lifeboat, speaking as a man who has two dogs and two cats, and knows about how you share territory with animals. He knows his stuff, this guy, and that part of the book I really liked. Well, we're joined now by Martin Goff, the administrator of the Booker Prize. Martin, you're in all of those meetings with those judges. The judges have told us it's been very amicable. Has it? Yes, it has. Uh, unusually I mean, so. Uh, unusually so. They discussed and they discussed hard and they argued hard, but there was never a moment's bitterness, never a moment's anger, and that's very unusual. And what's the consensus about the Anne Martel book? Um, that it, it certainly won, I don't know whether I'm allowed to say this, but it certainly won on a four to one basis, and I will not tell you which one was not so keen. Uh, but even the one person who was not quite as keen at the end said, no, I'm happy as well. Let's bring in the writer, Rachel Holmes, now. Rachel, your reaction to uh, Jan Martel winning the prize? It's an absolutely brilliant decision. Jan Martel is a genius, it's a popular choice. This is a truly groundbreaking and category breaking novel, and above all, it's original. It's a completely original book. Um, it's also a winner on an extremely strong shortlist. I mean, this one, this is the one year people talking out there. There are so many different books. There's such a diversity on the list. And to have therefore won amongst those is even more of an achievement. But as I'm sure you gathered from the mood of the hall, people are really pleased with this decision. Thank you very much, everybody. Now back to Kirsty. 
to you or at the camera? And with me is indeed Jan Martel now. Now you've heard the reaction's fantastic. You're a terribly popular winner. They think that your book is groundbreaking. I mean, are you just overwhelmed? <laughs> I am indeed overwhelmed. I'm delighted, I'm honored, I'm flattered, I'm humbled. Every adjective you can, every synonym but of those. Not only is it wonderful you, it's actually also wonderful uh, for Canongate Publishing, a small oh, Scottish public exactly, house, publishing Exactly, exactly. A small public, I'm so happy I'm with them. They've done a wonderful job of, of making a beautiful book, of helping editing it, of promoting it. I'm so happy to be with Canongate. Now, also, did you think when you were writing this book that it was going to be the book that was going to do it for you? Oh, of course not. I knew it was a good book. I liked it. I was happy with it. It satisfied me. So even if it had gone nowhere, I would have been happy with it. That it has met so many readers, including jury members of the Booker Prize, makes me even happier. But no, I, you don't write with prizes in mind. And tell me, when you're the, the range on the shortlist, I mean, three Canadian mm. writers, a pretty good, strong Commonwealth showing on this shortlist. Yeah, though I think uh, artists come from somewhere, but I think in this particular case, it's happenstances. There's three Canadians. There's lots of great Canadian writers, but there are great Australian writers, English writers, Scottish writers. I think it was just happenstance that three Canadian writers wrote good novels that saw favor, this jury saw favor in. Now, um, you set yourself an extraordinary task writing this book because you had did so much research. And, and in fact, the, the book wears its research very lightly. Mm. That you don't hit people over the head with it. But I mean, you started off knowing very little about the three religions that mm. were involved. You started presumably knowing very little about uh, animal psychology, mm. child psychology, surviving in a lifeboat at sea. Mm. How did you go about all that? Well, don't they usually say that you should write about what you know? I try exactly. to do the opposite. I, I try to learn about this world. So I did precisely what I didn't know about factually, but perhaps what I knew about intuitively or emotionally. Uh, so animals, religion, spirituality, to some extent we can all connect to that without necessarily knowing the facts about it. So the facts fleshed out maybe what I already felt. And uh, it was easy to do because I loved working on this book. It was a very easy book to write. Uh, so that drew me along. But you set yourself quite extraordinary challenges well, of detail. Uh, and of theme, yeah. Well, I think art should be ambitious. Uh, uh, we're here only for a few minutes. We have a few minutes to understand our, our, our life. So I want to try to understand as much as I can. And so I have no time to waste to do minor themes. I, I like to tackle the big themes. Whether I succeed or I fail, that's what I'd like to do. And how did you create this extraordinary world uh, that exists within this lifeboat, with the extraordinary face off of Richard Parker, who at the beginning of the book we think actually automatically is a, a human. That was a lovely little, yeah. the, 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 the tick in that yeah. was terrific. And how did you get inside the, uh, the idea of this 16-year-old Indian boy going through a journey from being a vegetarian to eating <laughs> fish's eyeballs yeah. apart from anything else? I mean, was, that, was some of it, were you just having fun some of the time? Oh, I was having fun all the time. <laughs> what I was also doing is just closing my eyes and imagining myself in some other person's position in another situation. I mean, this book is all about the use of imagination uh, in terms of faith and religion, but it, also in terms of storytelling. Uh, the key to storytelling is imagining yourself in another situation. But you, I think, have already said that when you came to this book as either an agnostic or an atheist, uh, you set the challenge to find out whether there is, but didn't realize that necessarily the, the journey that you would also make through the book oh, that's for very, yourself. That, that's very true. I started clear, very much a secular writer and slowly was taken in by what I was researching. And I, I've, I've done a 180 degree shift from not, can, not understanding how anyone can take any of this religious mumbo jumbo seriously to taking it very, very seriously and dismissing still a lot of it, but nonetheless yeah. being on that pathway uh, to try to, to, to get to a deeper understanding of, of what life is about. But not like a new age way. No, no, I, I, I think it's good to avoid the cafeteria approach yeah. where you, you pick and choose what you want, which is one good thing to be said about organized <laughs> religions. They have been around for a long time. Yes, but it's interesting, you, you deal with religion in a rather, um, in a sense, a kind of benign attitude towards it, whereas someone like Rowan to Mystery in Family yeah. Matters was saying that, you know, that it, it can cause searing divides. Oh, of course, of course. However, well. we, we, <coughs> we all know what is wrong with religion, but if there are only wrong things with it, it wouldn't have lasted 2,000 years in Christianity's case. There clearly is something else happening there, and that's what I was tapping into. I was not tapping into organized religion, into, into, to, to, into fundamentalist beliefs. I was tapping into faith. I want to, uh, to, to pick you up on uh, what was said. In fact, people say that the, the claim, in a sense, the dust jacket doesn't help you because one reviewer talks about magic realism. Mm. And, uh, and, and the actual dust flap itself says that this book will make you believe in God. Yeah, that's what one of the characters says in the author's note. Um, well, as I said, I believe in, 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 in 
literature and art taking on grand themes. And I think the question of God must be decided by everyone, one way or the other. I'm not saying that you must believe in any greater plan, but you must decide either way. Tell me, um, the, the wonderful idea that you know that Richard uh, and uh, the boy Pi pitch up on this, it seems like a huge floating blob in the Pacific mm. and it's swarming with meerkats mm. and in the trees are these kind of bulbous kind of strange things with a tooth, a human tooth mm. in each one. Mm. I mean, where did you pick that from? It's almost like science fiction. You know, sometimes inspiration, you have no idea where it well, comes from. It's not supposed to be that, real. Yeah. That, that I have no idea. I can't remember where it comes from. I think it just sort of arrived in my brain. So this would be a good piece of pure storytelling with no meaning, just yeah. a good storytelling that would grip the reader. Uh, but I can't, I can't, to be honest, I can't remember where it came from anymore. But the, the, the idea that you set off at the beginning of the book, and I think this is quite good because the, the audience isn't quite clear at the beginning, because you start off, which is meant to be an author's preface, saying that you heard about this story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, in a sense, you were saying, is it because you're creating a myth, you're creating folklore as you go along? What, are you saying that the story isn't true? Oh, is that what you're hinting heaven at? for fun. <laughs> But it did, it did seem like you know, you'd heard about it, you'd read about it, and I thought that was wonderful because actually you could take the story on a number of levels, mm -hmm. including the fact that was he ever in this boat with animals, mm -hmm. or were they really humans, mm -hmm. and so forth. And did you want to leave your audience with the idea that they can make up their own minds? Oh, totally. That, that's exactly it. The, the novel is about how you, how you choose to view reality. Uh, I, I think life is a story, and we can choose our story, and I argue might as well choose the better story. But to me, clearly, life, reality, is an interpretation. It's not what's out there, it's how you take it. And so in this novel, I offer, in essence, two stories to the reader. And at the very end, I say, will you choose? Which do you choose? So we're not talking of truth and falsehood, but of a better story. Now, this, of course, you know, tonight, things will change, and things have automatically changed already. Um, do you think that prizes, per se, change the way that writers approach their books. I mean, there's, what I really mean about that was that there's been a lot of criticism from the judges that what they were trying, what they were faced with were a number of books which were written as if they set out to win prizes. Mm. And do you have to sort of walk away and start again and think differently in order not to fall into trouble that you are a pri you know, that the prizes will mean a lot to you in the future? Listen, the, th the question of prizes, it's tough. Do you write a book to win a prize? Would that be like studying mathematics to win the lottery? It really is a lottery. I emphasize that my book was the luckiest. I mean, they're all, all, the, all 20 long-listed books are fine books. Uh, it's a question of meeting the right kind of jury that simply happens to like your novel. So I, I can't believe people would st spend all the time and all the effort it takes to write a book in the hope of winning a big prize. You say that you know, authors normally write about what they know about, but you set your challenge, set mm. the challenge of doing the opposite. In the time since this has been published, what is the challenge that you've been setting yourself for your next book? Well, um, I didn't think I'd be saying this, but I'd I like to try to tackle the Holocaust, which uh, it sounds really grim. Now, when I was telling people about Pi, they were rolling their eyes. So I, I, I grant that people will roll their eyes over this one. But uh, this one I'd like to tackle the Holocaust, because I find uh, our view of the Holocaust is very tied to facts, and it's so rooted in facts that we sometimes fail to apply the lessons of the Holocaust to other situations. And so here I'd like to create a portable metaphor for the Holocaust that could be applied to any Holocaust-like situation. Extraordinary, because if you had done this for this year, given what the judges said about we don't think there should be so many books about the Holocaust in World War II, yeah. perhaps you wouldn't have got all the way to the top. Well, it depends. Well, if you're presuming that I would treat it in a way that wouldn't have found favor with the judges. Uh, Anyway, that's my next, next task. Will it fail? Will it succeed? I don't know. I'll see. And tell me, so £50,000, what, that, that, what does that go to? What does that mean for you? Mm. Um, realistically, I think what I'll do is find a green investor. I don't know if you use that term in uh -huh. Britain. I don't like buying things. I don't like owning things. So I don't want to buy a house. Uh, I don't want to invest my money in such a way that it's exploiting someone in Bangladesh or India. So I'd like to maybe find a green investor so that my money earns a modest sum of money and without exploiting anyone. And Martel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And that is all from the Booker Prize 2002. From the winner and myself, good night.